Habakkuk chapter 1, and we will read verses 12 through 2 5. Habakkuk 1 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained, ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You made mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. This is the word of the Lord. Well, what we're seeing in Habakkuk is God's ways are not our ways. God's timing is not our timing. And hopefully we know the implication, but I'll just say it. Sometimes God just doesn't make sense, does he? We have our perspective, our ambition, our thought of how things should go and when they should go that way. And God does not conform to us. And so we're perplexed. We are confused. Maybe even in this moment of history, you've been confused by what seems to be God orchestrating or God permitting evil to rise in authority. Maybe you've been perplexed by that. Maybe you've been perplexed by God permitting or even orchestrating physical pain in your life. Emotional pain. Maybe it's financial pain. Because we all know God could have prevented it. But for some unknown reason, at least unknown to us, he hasn't. Again, he permitted or he orchestrated. We got to remember, we must remember always, God is always good. God is omnipotent. He is almighty, full of power. He does not grow weary. He does not faint. He does not have asthma where he can't breathe and he's got to say time out. If you go on a hike with God, he's not saying, wait up. He's saying, get on my back. I'll carry you. And I will never run out of power. So that's who we're talking about. That's who we're looking to. That's who we're understanding. And we have to remember these things. Because what that also means is he's always good. He's almighty. Therefore, he uses evil to bring about his goodwill. He's not up there thinking, man, what am I going to do now that that corrupt person is in power? That nation is rogue or whatever. No, he causes all things to work together for good. Do you believe that? It is the word of the Lord in Romans 8, 28. But do you at a practical street level dining room table, computer, uh, uh, keyboard in hand, whatever it is. Do you believe God causes all things to work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes? It's more than a piece of Hobby Lobby artwork. It's an anchor. It's a foundation. It is an announcement of peace in what feels like chaos. But some of us still conclude, for whatever reason, that God must not be good. Or he must not be almighty. 
Because we pray and we pray and we pray and we cry until we cannot cry anymore about something. And God didn't seem to answer. He didn't seem to say something. He didn't seem to do anything. And we conclude he must not be good or he must not care. That is, if we're honest and we truly try to live for the Lord, oftentimes God won't make sense, will he? That's the heart of Habakkuk. That's, the, that's like the historical moment the prophet Habakkuk was in. Sincerely wanting to honor God, but sincerely perplexed, confused. Let me summarize where we've been in Habakkuk and where we're going to go this week and next. Habakkuk had this first cry in chapter 1, and in essence he said, God, why don't you care about all the wrong that your people are doing? Why don't you do something about it? Maybe you remember God did reply, oh, oh, prophet, oh, Habakkuk, I am doing something. I do care. Therefore, I'll send the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, which is startling. And Habakkuk lets us know that. And this is what we just read here, beginning in verse 12, when he responds with a, say what? (laughs) The Babylonians, how could you? They are far more wicked than your people. After all, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. To which God replies, I know what the Babylonians are like. And after I have used them to judge my people, I will judge them and bring them to ruin. So can we agree from Habakkuk and probably from our own lives, God's ways are not our ways. Can we agree to that? (laughs) And can we agree from Habakkuk and probably from our own lives, God's time is not our time. That's, That's what is happening here. And this is why we've got to know the word of the Lord. It's like when we get into the moment of crisis and we feel like God is doing something strange, the devil will whisper into your ear, forsaken. He doesn't care about you anymore. He's moved on from you. And you need to know the word of the Lord so you can say, no, I've read Habakkuk and I know how this plays out and I therefore know my God is good. This is strange, but he hasn't forsaken me. He's working. I just don't see it right now. But if you don't know the word of the Lord, you may be prone to listen to that. Aren't you glad, by the way, Jesus knew the word of the Lord when he was tempted in the wilderness? Come with me. You can have all of this. And Jesus said, in essence, it's already mine. And the way I show that is I die for it. Wow. Aren't you glad he knew the word of the Lord? He knew the will of the Lord and he obeyed the Lord. Well, you, if you have repented of sin and trusted in Christ, you have the Spirit of the Lord living living in you. And you can't just say, well, Jesus did that, I never can. No, the Spirit that led Jesus, which said the Spirit led him into the wilderness in Luke 4, that Spirit lives in you. And the way to fight is to remember. It's not create, it's remember what he's already said, who he already is. And when you remember who he already is, you know his name is I am. Therefore, he always is. He does not change. Well, we see in verses 12, uh, uh, 1, 12 through 2, 1, that God's ways are not our ways. Habakkuk here was in, as we would say in the army, he was in deep struggle status. Like he was really struggling here in this moment with God because God appeared to be inconsistent. He's saying one thing, but he seems to be acting contrary. And so from Habakkuk's perspective, when he complained, when he cried out to God and God spoke back, God didn't really help anything. God only muddied the waters with his response. He seemed to make a bigger problem here. And Habakkuk cries this second time. In essence, God, how could you? How could you do that? You're the Holy One. I know you. That is out of character for you. How could you? So then again, in the modern context, or maybe like we would say in the the military, uh, imagine a junior officer listening to his commanding officer share something. and, And this junior officer is really perplexed. And he says, sir, 
permission to speak freely. Like you better tread easy. If the commanding officer says no, then you just you bite your tongue, you march on with your orders. Or maybe the officer says, speak. And Habakkuk here, it's as he's looking to the Lord, he says, in essence, permission to speak freely, Lord. And he's he's crying. Again, as a child, I don't understand. How do you expect me to be your follower and to trust you? When what you just said to me cuts against everything I know to be true about you. How do you want me to follow you now? The rub of the confusion is found, is seen as Habakkuk explains God to God. He just says, in essence, let me remind you of who you are. Verse 12, are you not from everlasting? So this is Habakkuk crying back to God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. Lord, you have ordained them. He's speaking of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. You have ordained them as judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You are of Purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You're holy. How can you? He was genuinely confused. Have you been confused? Have you looked out your window since March? <laughs> Have you turned on the news since March? I mean, I'm looking at a room, what, a quarter full? And you have masks on. At least you're supposed to. <laughs> That's confusing. Welcome to 2020 in this fallen world. Habakkuk is just, what? You're holy. How could you? But I, I want us to know there's a difference between confusion or, or doubt and unbelief. Okay? There's a difference. And one pastor, I guess, concisely put it this way. Like Habakkuk, the doubter questions God and may even debate with God, but the doubter doesn't abandon God. But unbelief is rebellion against God, a refusal to accept what he says and does. So unbelief is an act of the will, while doubt is born out of a troubled mind and a broken heart. I find that very helpful. Because I know what it is to sincerely love the Lord, to sincerely want to honor him, but to be confused. This seems out of character. This seems unlike you. And you know I love you, Lord. And you know I want to honor you, Lord. But I just don't know. Surely you've been there. And, and young one, if you haven't, live long enough and you will. God does not always do what we want him to do. His ways are not our ways. But I think what we gather from this is Habakkuk is not showing immature, grumbling, complaining, sinful response to the Lord. Habakkuk is modeling for us a mature response to the Lord. This is a, a well-established, mature faith. So you notice he's not dodging anything. He's going right back to the Lord with this confusion. He's going right back trying to, to answer, the, uh, reconcile these hard questions. He's wrestling. He's doing this hard mental heart work. Coming to grips with who God is and what God said he's about to do. And he sees they don't seem to reconcile, but he knows God is true and God is good and God is one. And he does not contradict himself. And so, Lord, I'm not going to run away from you and quit on you. I'm secure enough in you to step right back into you and say, I don't get it. 
And I'm saying the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all unrighteousness. We are forgiven. We are righteous. We are adopted. We are forever grafted into the family of God. And when things are confusing, don't put your head down and run away. Don't pretend it's not happening. Step right back into it. I don't get it, God. I know you love me. I know I'm secure in Christ, but I don't understand how all of this works. This is out of character. At least it feels, it seems to be from my perspective. So don't ignore the tension. Humbly go to the Lord in the tension. That's what Habakkuk's doing here. In verses 14 and 15, he's acknowledging, Lord, it looks like your people are helpless here. In fact, let's read 14 and 15. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. Now he's speaking of, of the Chaldeans. He brings them up with a hook and drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his drag net, so he re rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices. So this, is, this is like idolatry now. He, he, he sacrifices uh, to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly giving uh, mercilessly killing nations forever Habakkuk here is saying to the Lord your people look helpless and your enemy looks haughty and it sure does look like you're okay with all that am I seeing it right Lord that's, that's what this man of God is doing here in this moment. Which takes us back to verse 12. This is key. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. H Habakkuk knew that God is the everlasting one. He is the eternal one. And it was from eternity that God ordained, God orchestrated this moment. That's what Habakkuk is confessing here. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? Habakkuk was a, a contemporary of Isaiah. They both worked in the, in the temple about the same time. And so they would have been familiar with each other. What I'm getting at is Habakkuk would have been familiar with the writing of Isaiah. And listen to what Isaiah said in Isaiah 37 about the coming strength, the coming power of the Assyrians. Okay? Isaiah 37, 26, Isaiah, led by the, the Spirit of God, quoting the Lord now, says, Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I plan from days of old what I now bring to pass. That you should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruins. Say what? Did you just tell me the Assyrians are doing what God determined in eternity past they would do? Why yes, that's what I'm saying. That's Isaiah. Habakkuk is saying the same thing. Now the reason I want to... The reason I'm belaboring this point, the reason maybe I would give the history lesson of the Assyrians coming in and conquering those, those ten, uh, or, or, or coming in to conquer uh, the people of God, um, is because we have a pattern. We, we, have, we have a foundation to build on. We begin to understand who God is. That is, what I'm hoping will happen in this moment. I'm, I'm going I'm to just show my cards here for a moment. What I'm trying to do, what I'm hoping to do, is one of two things. Either affirm a right theology of God or to begin to build a right theology of God. Biblical theology, that's all I'm doing. Forming our hearts to know God rightly. Not the God of, of my beliefs, but the God of Scripture. And what I'm getting at is God is sovereign. It's a big word, probably don't use it in everyday language, but it means God is absolutely free and he rules and reigns over all, including the Assyrians, including the Babylonians, including you, me. From days of old, he determined what he now brings to past. 
to pass. So he says in verse 12, are you not from everlasting? Are you not the eternal one? Are you not the sovereign one? Is there any part of your life that feels out of control? (laughs) Are there things happening in this world that appear to be out of control? What I'm saying is, no. They're happening because they're under control. Under the control of the only wise God. Under the control of the only one that's truly good. Under the control that is the one that is love. Under the control of the one who has unlimited power. Full wisdom, full goodness, full love orchestrating all of these events. So what this is saying is presidents, Congress, every politician under the sovereign rule of God. Protests, rioting, political action groups, social uh, uh, turmoil, under the sovereign rule of God. Viruses, natural and man-made, under the sovereign rule of God. Spouses, children, headaches, heartaches, not out of control. Under the rule and the reign of the one true and living God, the maker of heaven and earth. This is how we make sense of this. This is how we endure. If if everything, just say the last three minutes of what I said to you. Let's say it's not true. Serious question. I'm curious. How on earth do you sleep at night then? And I mean it. How, How are you not frantic? How are you not taking up arms? How are you not barbing and and trying to get even with people? And maybe that's why you don't sleep. And maybe that's why you have your verbal barbs, jabs. And you give in to underhanded practices to get even and to prove a point. It's perhaps your heart will not agree. God is sovereign. He's got this thing. But I want to invite you in to these gospel waters. Peace is what he gives us. It's not naive, it's informed. God is in the heavens, he does what he pleases. Aren't you glad he's good? Aren't you glad that he's also wise? And aren't you glad that he's also strong? So we can say, We shall not die. That is, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And therefore, we can confess his ways are not our ways. He's not offended. It's not a mark of immaturity. We can say it because we're secure in him. His ways are not our ways. But we go on because his timing is not our timing. We see this as we get into chapter 2. In verse 1, we see Habakkuk here who, who has just given his complaint. And he's like, now, I've spoken freely. What do you have to say? I'm going to sit up on the wall and see how this whole thing plays out. He says, I will take my stand at the watch post. I will station myself at the tower and look out to see what he will say to me. And what I will answer, accor- or what he, what I will answer according to my complaint. In verse 2, the Lord answered me. This is glorious. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. This is not what Habakkuk thought God was going to say. But God does not say what we want him to say, does he? God says what's needed to be said. So we have the scriptures because they're profitable. You know that? Sure, we may want more from God, but it may not profit us. The scriptures are inspired and profitable. 
for us. They equip us. They train us in righteousness. God here is correcting Habakkuk. He's saying what needs to be said so that Habakkuk will continue to make progress in the faith, continue to mature in the Lord, and that any doubt will be settled and he will be a man of perfect peace as his heart, as his eyes are fixed on the Lord. And therefore, you know what happens when he matures? His worship improves. It's a more informed and a more accurate worship of God. And that's what God is doing in us. What feels like a no is for our good. What feels like a correction is for our good. God is teaching us. God is growing us. God is turning us so that we will more accurately worship him. I think it's one thing to say the Grand Canyon spectacular, right? It's another thing to stand on the edge of that dadgum thing and, and not have any words to say. Right? You can see a picture and say, wow, I bet you that's cool. And then you go stand there and realize that picture was pretty pedestrian to co compared to what I'm seeing right now. And I think churches are full of people that say, wow, I think the Lord is cool. And they haven't walked up to the edge and tried to take him in. And that's what the Lord's committed to. He'll walk us to the edge of ourselves so that we're satisfied in him, so that we marvel at him. So because of this interaction, Habakkuk would rightly worship. Because of our time, we too will rightly worship. God is orchestrating all of these events in our day so that we will better more accurately worship him. He hasn't done this just to frustrate you because you're bored or you need something to be frustrated about. He did it to grow us, to sanctify us. He's working in a way so that at the end of this, there's one hero. It's not me, it's not you, it's not even us. It's Jesus, the exalted one. So we notice he says, Habakkuk, write it down. And aren't you glad he wrote it down? Like, Seriously, aren't you glad he wrote this down? Aren't you glad he obeyed the Lord? Just as a side note, there are people that need you to obey the Lord. Just as you benefit from, from Habakkuk's obedience, people out there will benefit from our obedience. So when the Lord says, write it down, write it down. When he says, get out of bed, get out of bed. When he says, go and tell, go and tell. So he says, write this down. And he says this. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. Still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie if it seems slow. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. In other words, get comfortable. Watch. I'm going to keep my word, both about the Chaldeans and my judgment of the Chaldeans. It's going to be awful. But it's going to happen because I'm faithful. It's not happening right now. Don't grow restless on me. Wait for me. You think Habakkuk's like to be told to wait? Anybody like to be told, wait? Anybody? I love it when they tell me to wait. Nobody? I don't think so. Why? Because if we're honest, waiting is an interruption to our plan. The babysitter's late. Oh. How about this one? Surely we've all experienced this. We'll be out to turn on your cable or to do whatever between like eight and two. Just hang out and wait. Really? I got nothing better to do with my time than just hang out at the house and wait for you? Like, we all have things we want to do, right? Time is precious. We have ambitions. We have desires. We want to go do them. And so waiting is an interruption to the plan unless it comes from the Lord. And waiting is not an interruption. Waiting is the plan. Waiting doesn't interrupt obedience. Waiting is obedience. Because he's doing something in us while as we wait. How do you know if you have an entitled spirit unless he says, no, wait, not yet. <laughs> it's easy to throw stones at people and say they have an entitled spirit. That's what's wrong with our country. I bet you some of us realize we have an entitled spirit. Because we're American, by God. This country was born for freedom. And the Lord said, wait. And we get wound up around the axle, don't we? See, it's not just those people that have an entitled spirit. It is tempting to all of us. 
How do we know that we struggle with patience until he says, wait? How do we know if our motives are pure until he says, wait? You see, when he, when he tells us to wait, he's growing us. He's drawing things out of us. He's revealing pride. Maybe more than that, he's revealing a, 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 a self-reliant life. Waiting means we're not in control. Someone else is. And we hate that. But if we love the Lord and we know he's good, then we wait. His timing is not our timing, but we trust him. You see, God is doing more than fixing our problems of the moment. He's growing us. And part of the growing is learning to wait, learning to trust, which this is where this, this moment, from, this word from the Lord ends here. My timing, it's not your timing. You know what you should do? You should trust me. What should we do when we pray, when we ask God to do A, B, or C, and he says, no, no. Wait, what should we do? Obviously, it's not give up on him. We should trust in him. Behold, verse 4, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor. Don't get drunk and try to drown all this out. Don't get, again, in army, we would call it liquid courage. Wine is a traitor. It'll betray you, won't it? Wine promises you peace or strength or whatever, but it's a liar. It'll tear you down. One is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Sin is as is greedy. You'll give it a little and it wants everything. His greed is as wide as Sheol like death. He never has enough. He gathers for himself all the nations and collects as his own all People. So we live by faith. We trust. We live by faith, not by sight, not by logic, not by feelings, certainly not by fear. What does this say? The righteous shall live by his faith. Or the one who by faith is righteous shall live. That is, this is, this is what Paul was building Romans on. Galatians on. He's, he's working this glorious, this glorious logic that God's plan from the beginning has been be righteous by faith, not by works. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous. And Paul is working that out in the book of Romans, saying to you, me, to all that have ears to hear, you are not right with God by your efforts. Oh, hear me on that. Caitlin, this is what we were talking about before the service. We're not right with God by our efforts. We're right with God by saying, God, what you said is true. I believe. I trust that. Don't try harder. Die and receive. Don't set out to prove yourself. Agree. In fact, in, 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 in Genesis 15, when this, when this uh, word was first fo- spoken uh, from God to, um, to Abraham about the covenant, in, in the Hebrew, it's where we get our, eventually we get our word, amen. In the Hebrew, it's, it's like, like a variation of amen. Abraham, amen, God, and was made righteous. So watch this. Let's, let's, let's see how this works out. You ready? This is going to be interactive. Jesus is Lord. Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, you see how that works, though. I said something true. You said, my whole heart agrees with that. And the Lord said to Abraham, you will be righteous by faith. And Abraham said, amen. Isn't that our story? And, and when he tells Habakkuk, you wait, it's going to happen. Not according to your timetable. You wait, it's going to happen. He said, amen. And, and, and back where he said, in, in verse 12, we shall not die. What's God doing right here? You shall live. He's focusing on not dying. God emphatically is saying, live. The righteous will live. It's faith without works is dead. Live it. Show that you, you have amen to Jesus. That you have trusted him. You've asserted he's true. 
And I'm living for Him now. That's what He's saying here. Habakkuk, don't go sit on the wall and wait. Live. Don't sit up there and complain and set the believers that example. Live for me and show that you trust me. And we can sit here in this historical moment and retreat and complain. We can sit back and cast stones. And you know what God is saying to all of us? Don't sit back and watch America spiral into ruin. Don't sit back and just watch the political uh, system collapse. Don't sit back and live for Jesus. Get off social media. Get off those temptations that are, that are leading us into complaining or being frantic. And live for Jesus. Amen, all that he said. Live. The one who by faith is righteous shall live. I'll say it again. Because these words change the world. Literally. Martin Luther, the reformer, was born again as he turned these words over in his head. The one who by faith is righteous shall live. And all the burdens of hell fell off of him. And he was willing to stand up against that corrupt church and declare the true gospel. And we are here today in large measure because of God's mercy in that moment. Can your heart dream of 500 years from now what this world will be like if just the 50 of us or 30 of us will receive the word of the Lord? The one who by, right, the one who by faith is righteous shall live. I prayed just a few moments ago or quite a while ago now <laughs> that we would all take that next step, whatever it is, are you willing to take the next step for the Lord? And I mean it, may, maybe for you it is pain and sorrow and, you, and you're here today to, to you know, throw something to the Lord to say, I'm here, speak to me. Give me some direction. And he says, I, I have. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And so then you say, amen. And you go live a life of dependence upon the Lord, his word, his wisdom, his good heart, not upon yourself. And when he, when he speaks to you through his word, you don't say, yeah, but. You say, yes, Lord. So maybe he's calling you today, now, to die to self, to be born again. Surrendering all to Jesus. He's good, friend. He's gooder. <laughs> He's more wonderful than your dreams. And he doesn't make promises that he doesn't keep. Write it down. Wait for it. He keeps his word. And he's calling you. He's wooing you. Receive him. Maybe he's calling you to that, as I, as I prayed about something new. Starting something new for the Lord. You, you think about this moment of church history where so many of the, of the programs that we have in a church, they've just been knocked down, haven't they? Maybe the Lord wants to start something new. Not contrary to the preaching of the word and the gathered saints worshiping him, but about how we do discipleship, how we do member care. Maybe you've been having this thought, this dream, this Somebody asked me the other day about our space being empty during the week. And if we're going to have to do online school for, the, for this first quarter, why not open parts of the building for kids to come here to do online school together at, at proper distance? And here's the look I gave that one. It never occurred to me. I'm not saying that's what we're going to do, but it just never occurred to me. And I'm thankful that individual shared that with me because now it gets things turning in me. And we begin to pray and dream. Is there a way to redeem this building? In this moment, maybe God's calling you to something. The one who by faith is righteous shall live. Go live it. Share it. Let us help you in it. Maybe it's reconciliation. Maybe when, when you've been confronted in your sin of waiting, evil has come out. Ugly has come out. 
pain has come out and you've hurt people. The one who by faith is righteous shall live. Go be reconciled. You're secure in Christ. It's finished. So we don't live. Uh, we won't die. No, we live active for the Lord. 